All right, big story of the day, uh, Nigeria's gross domestic product for the second quarter of 2020 contracting by 6.1% uh, in real terms. Chika is doing the sign of the cross. <laughs> According to the Bureau of Statistics, uh, the decline, of course, largely attributable, attributable to significantly lower levels of both domestic and international economic activity during the quarter, which resulted from the nationwide shutdown efforts aimed at containing the COVID-19 pandemic. The decline also ends the three-year trend of low but positive real growth rates recorded uh, since the 2016 uh, recession. Joining me live uh, to discuss uh, this report is uh, the CEO of the CFG Advisory, uh, Mr. Tiwa Tilewa Adibajo. Uh, I also have, of course, uh, Robert uh, Omotonde, uh, analyst, uh, with us to discuss this. Good morning to you, gentlemen. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Good morning. Uh, First of all, uh, uh, Tilewa, I wanted to ask, with the figure that we just printed at, uh, the contraction of 6.1%, was that in line with your expectations? And do we breathe a sigh of relief in that it wasn't as bad as some of the double-digit projections that we saw out there? Well, I think the projection, this is twice the, um, at least twice the uh, projection from the government, uh, what they had pro projected. And I think the numbers we should be looking at is fourth quarter numbers. Uh, but for these numbers, I think um, it's, it's in line. I think we we're looking at anywhere between five to 10% contraction, and we're at six. Uh, so it's in line with the projections, and it's something that is expected. So it's, there's no surprises. I don't really see any surprises with these numbers, so it's not it's not anything that should surprise anybody at the moment. It's the effects that we should need to talk about. Okay, fantastic. Okay, okay let's talk about the effects. Um, for instance, um, when we look at you know um, oil production, for instance, and um, I want to ask you about because you know the, the um, oil GDP and non-oil GDP both contracted. But I'll start with oil first. Um, the effects going forward, when you think about the what's needed to happen for a recovery. Oil production, I want to get your thoughts on oil production and the OPEC cuts um, that have been announced, plus the fact that Nigeria and Iraq have been fingered as laggards with regards to compliance. Going forward, looking at a recovery, having the oil sector reco you know, recover, how does the production cuts from OPEC factor into whether or not we actually make a recovery or not? Well, I think we need to take a look at the fundamental structural issues that we're dealing with. I think the reason why there's so much focus on the oil revenues right now is because in the last two quarters, of, in the first two quarters of this year, in excess of 95% of our revenues went exclusively for debt service. Uh, so we're, we're struggling with a, a fiscal deficit, and we've not been able to diversify the sources of our revenue. Uh, there's nothing new there. But what is even more disturbing is the fact that the World Bank loans that we wanted to apply for to be able to help us uh, plug the hole in our deficit has not been forthcoming because we've not been able to meet the terms of those loans in terms of what they've asked us to do in terms of the structural reforms like the single window and all that. So those are the issues that we're now beginning to concentrate on seeing how the get out of jail card that we're looking for now is the fact that we see a significant increase in the prices of oil. Uh, if that happens, then we're out of jail. Uh, but right now, without uh, an increase in oil price and the squeeze on our production quotas, uh, we're, in a, we're, in a, we're in a dilemma. And we have to live with that dilemma. Because even if the oil prices improve, we still need to finance the def our fiscal deficit. And we need to find a way to address uh, the issues with our, rev with our revenues. Thank you so much for that. So, okay, to, to non-oil now, uh, that also uh, suffered its first decline since the third quarter of 2017. Affected sectors like transportation and storage, accommodation and food services, construction, education, real estate, trade. Is, is there cause for alarm uh, when you think of how each of these numerous number of sectors is going to recover uh, moving forward? Or is that still tied to what you've just said with regards to whether or not we get these funds from the World Bank and how things move forward from there? Well, um, like I said, what is the effect? We, we have a plan. Um, we used to have an economic recovery growth plan, which said the economy will grow 7% this year. Clearly, that's not going to happen. So we've now come up with a new plan, which we call the Economic Sustainability Plan. So um, what we need to all be asking ourselves is, we knew that what is happening now is not something that was not predicted or was not something we were not expecting. So everybody was expecting it. So the question is, how bad is it going to get? So 
what is happening to that economic sustainability plan? The problem we have now is that there's no leadership with the economy of this country today. That is the problem we have. Because there's no leadership with the economy, we have lost business confidence. A lot of the foreign investors with the bond investors are trying to get out. They cannot get their money out because there's no dollars to get out of their investments. And there's a mini crisis in that sector in terms of foreign investor confidence in Nigeria. It's at an all-time low. Business confidence is low. We have a double jeopardy of a pandemic and an economic shock, which we're managing. And at this very critical time, we have done so much work to come up with a plan. But unfortunately, nobody's driving that plan. We don't know who is in charge of that plan. So if we don't have, if we could not implement that plan, which is the economic sustainability plan, then how would we reverse all these issues? What are the stimulus packages we need to put in various sectors of the economy to get it going? The Nigerian economy is still extremely resilient, but we need the leadership that is going to drive this economy out of a recession. So what is lacking now is leadership and business confidence. We need to restore that. Thank you so much for that. So on the, on the question of leadership, I have to follow up. We've got the federal executive, uh, federal uh, uh, FEC that meets weekly, uh, the vice chairman, uh, vice president chairs uh, an economic uh, council. We've got the economic advisory council. We've got, you know, a, a sizable number, an economic team made up of the Ministry of Finance, the head of the, minist the Minister of Finance, uh, the central bank governor. I mean, can one really say that we, there is leadership lacking with all these economic teams and, you know, set up to, to drive the, the country forward? Yes, who is coordinating everybody? Who is in charge? Um, you can't tell me that this is the person that's in charge, that if somebody comes out today and says that this is the direction we're going, it's going to happen. If you take a look at the economic uh, restructuring plan, which was put out itself, it talks about implementation as being a key thing. You cannot leave each minister to... Uh, each minister has his role to play in terms of running its own ministry. But then you need a strong leadership to be able to make decisions, to be able to drive the economy forward. It is very important. In every country, the president of the country is the one in charge of driving an economy out of a recession. You've seen what the German chancellor has done in terms of what she has done to be able to push her country back from the brink. Every, every leader has to take charge at this point in time. And unfortunately, on our own side, we do not know where that leadership is. And that is really where the problem is. The plan is there. Like you said, we have all these committees, we have all these structures, but there needs to be coordination. For instance, let me tell you something. Monetary policy is no longer effective in Nigeria today. So, but you need to work with monetary policy. You need to work with fiscal policy. You need to work with trade policy and investment policy. That involves coordinating the Ministry of Finance, uh, the, the Central Bank, and of course, the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment. Those three ministers need to be coordinated under a clear direction of the presidency for us to drive this economy forward. And of course, all the other ministers are there in support. So if we do not have this as a basis, with these guys meeting regularly, with all these other things you're saying, it's very difficult for us to see direction and to build business confidence. To me, that is really what the, uh, what, what the problem is. All these numbers are not a surprise to anybody. Mm. Thank, thank you so much for that. So just, just to follow up on uh, monetary policy not uh, exactly working in Nigeria, just to illustrate for our, our, our viewers, uh, you're essentially saying that the, the benchmark rates, um, that's not, uh, when it, it's not filtering down to the economy. Is that, is that where you're, you're going? Well, ironically, um, if you take a look at it, for instance, banks today, if you, even if you have a billion naira, the banks today will not give you more than 4% or 5% for your deposits. Uh, and I think they're lending now at maybe close to 12 or 13 percent, which is a significant reduction from what we had before. Uh, but there are a lot of distortions with the MRR and the and the cash reserve requirements that the that the central bank is using now to control the monetary policy. But the question is that if you do not provide credit, how do you grow the economy? But if you have looked at an anti-growth strategy over the last four years then right now it's not effective. The only effective thing they're doing now in the central bank is the intervention. So it goes beyond a lot of what you are saying. So what tends to happen now is that you need the synchronization 
of things like your trade policy, your investment policy, with monetary policy and fiscal policy. You know we're suffering on the fiscal side. That is really where the problem is because 95% of our revenues are going just only to debt service. So we have a deficit that we need to finance. So we need synchronization and we need coordination of these critical ministries and we need that leadership that needs to be strong and resolute. Thank you so much for that. If I could follow up on the credits uh, to the economy, uh, based on the um, loan to deposit, okay, loan to deposit ratio and the fact that you know the central bank has said credit has increased to the economy, is it an issue of it not um, being widely distributed? If you can, briefly. Yeah, you take a look at the credit to the economy. Yes, we're saying credit has gone from 15 trillion naira to 17 trillion naira. The question is, who is taking that 17 trillion naira? I mean. Maybe Sir, half of that. Uh, uh, is Tilara, just Tilara, one second. We just have to take a quick break. We'll be right back with you to continue this conversation. Welcome back to the Global Business Report on Arise News. We continue our discussion on Nigeria's second quarter GDP figures, which contracted by 6.1%. We, well, of course, already have uh, the CEO of CFG Advisory, Mr. Tilewa Debajo. We're also joined by Robert Omotende, an investment uh, analyst who is with us live uh, in our studio. Okay, um, but Robert, uh, you're welcome. But Tilewa, I do want you to finish your points on credits to uh, the economy because we have to quickly go to a break. If you could uh, complete your point on the uh, amount of credit that's been to gone, you know, out to the economy. I believe uh, you said it rose from 15 trillion to about 18 or so, but whether or not that's yes. widespread. No, no, I think that's, I mean, we have to give credit where credit is due. So the policies in terms of getting banks to lend has had an effect in the sense that we've seen an increase from 15 trillion to about 17.5 trillion, which is quite positive. Um, but the question now is that if you now take a look at the sectoral breakdown of that, that's a different story entirely. But we also have that in terms of supporting all that credit is all the intervention funds, which I think has had a positive impact on certain specific sectors. So we've seen some positivity in that aspect. But, you know, we need to look more in the consumer credit space, which is really where we are going to create a stimulus for growth and uh, increasing aggregate demand. Thank you so much for that, Tilo. Uh, Robert, let me bring you in here. Um, services, as far as contribution to uh, GDP, continues to be the leader here. Services for Q2 uh, 2020, 53.4% contribution, 246 for agriculture, 218 for industries. Um, there's been a lot of focus on agriculture, uh, Robert. Should there be more of a, you know, a larger push uh, to you know, getting more out of services as its contribution to the economy of Nigerian economy? Uh, the fact that what you see agriculture contributing to our GDP is still largely in the primary stage of production. Um, uh, I've argued in several fora that we have jumped a stage of growth uh, in that we, we've not developed our manufacturing sector, and what we then do is to focus on services. Now, services accounting for 53% of our GDP you know, it's, it's, it's something that should worry us. Uh, and this, this is one of the reasons why we do not have the jobs. Uh, that's why unemployment keeps rising. Uh, MBS released the data last week, and you saw that if you combine uh, unemployment and unemployment rates, you know, you'll find out that you have, um, uh, I mean, uh, up to 55%, you know, and that's very alarming. So for me, uh, I would think that while we will not jettison investment in agriculture, uh, one of the ways to also get that sector contribute to the larger economy is then to de-emphasize, you know, produce from the farm, which has been the major contributor to what you yeah. see in the GDP numbers, you know, and to take yeah. it a step further, right? Rather than, mm -hmm. you know, getting some of those produce and exporting them out of the country, what can we mm -hmm. do to them in terms of value addition? And that speaks to mm. the manufacturing sector. So if you look at manufacturing today, you know, if you take out services, you know, and you take out uh, the agri sector, industry is one sector that is not contributing as much because the total contribution of industry to our GDP, as we speak today, is only about 21%. And in that industry sits oil and gas. So if I take out oil and gas, you know, uh, out of the industry statistic, it means that the manufacturing sector is barely contributing 10% to the real sector of the economy. This is where we need to focus on the more, 
so that we can, you know, drive those jobs, drive those employment. Look at economies that have, you know, that are industrialized. You know, today when we look at Nigeria's GDP, we say consumption accounts for a larger chunk of it. And I see, think MBS released some data about some months past, you know, that suggests to us that food is a major contributor to our GDP. We shouldn't just be a consuming nation. We should look further to how we can develop the manufacturing sector so that our contribution to GDP will be balanced. You know, we know we've argued that we have a broad-based, you know, so to speak, a, a diversified economy. You know, but the chunk that services contribute right now is that which we cannot sustain. You know, I think telecoms is accounting for close to 15, 17 percent of the services contribution, which is good. It means that we didn't have to open up and unlock so many other sectors. Power is there. You know, if you unlock power sector, it helps you to further grow your economy, create more businesses, you know, than we have currently. All right, thank you so much for that, Robert. Uh, I, I want to throw this question to both of you, but I'll start with uh, Tilewa. Uh, mining and, and quarrying. Um, the the, the uh, federal government had recently had this uh, initiative that they've pushed forward, uh, which is the uh, Presidential Artisanal Gold Mining Development Initiative, PAGMI. So mining and quarrying, uh, we saw a, a, a contraction of 6.6% uh, in the second quarter from growth of 4.5% in Q1. Is the initiative of the government with regards to this, you know, push for mining, is that encouraging with what the potential could be moving forward, Tilawa? Definitely. I think, like, I think as Robert said earlier, you, we need to begin to unlock other sectors of the economy. Uh, power is one, mining is, an, is another one, and as he mentioned, value-added manufacturing and agriculture. So mining is one of them. But I think what is happening in the mining sector now is that we get again, our laws are very good. Um, the investment promotion acts are very positive. But what we need now in the mining sector in Nigeria is to begin to bring in the big mining companies from abroad, the corporate mining companies, the multinationals uh, from South Africa and from Australia who have the necessary expertise. If we begin to, um, we need to move away from artisanal mining uh, into more of industrial and commercial mining. And I think that's the next step we need to take now. So the policy now has to be to see how we can bring in the bigger companies that can, you know, begin to make it the major investments that can carry us uh, going forward. Thank you for that, Tila. Robert, um, we've only got about less than a couple of minutes. I want to get your both uh, thoughts on the recovery. Um, do you see us still maintaining negative growth in the third quarter? And when do you see us getting out of this back to positive growth? Well, I think that it's, it's going to be a long haul, uh, to be honest, because what we've seen right now, it's a contraction of 6.1%. That is massive, you know, for an economy, you know, that, I mean, again, we've almost lost track of, you know, the 10-year growth trajectory, which we said we were at a strong GDP of 7 to 8%, you know, since the last recession. You know, perhaps if we've done certain, you know, reforms, you know, since the last recession, maybe we won't be where we are now, that even if there will be a contraction, it won't be as much. But the good news is that we've seen even developed economy record worse uh, level of uh, decline. So, but as far as I, I am concerned, I think that uh, third quarter definitely will still be a contraction. We will be lucky if, you know, we move out of that in fourth quarter, but I don't expect it. I think the recovery will be more of 2021 uh, events, and the sort of recovery, you know, will be most likely w shape. you know, meaning that uh, you're likely going to have, you know, a little bit of uh, moderation in the decline, and after a while, you know, you can see the economy then pick up. Uh, again, it's not, uh, it's, uh, we, are not, we are not in good times in mm. terms of the economy. And what the government can do is to put his heart together in order to, you know, put in place plans that will outlast the current phase of uh, conundrum that we are facing. Uh, definitely, it shouldn't be business as usual. And you would expect that the government should take more initiative to drive reforms that will unlock uh, several sectors of the economy that are currently on the top. We've run out of time. Tilewa, do you agree or not? I'm so sorry. I wanted to give you more time, but do you, yes or no? no do you agree okay. with Robert? I think I, I agree with what Robert has said. It's about leadership, uh, reform, and direction. It is the leadership that will determine the numbers we have at the end of the year.
My thanks to the CEO of CFG Advisory, Tilewa Adebajo, and investment analyst Robert Omotunde. Thank you so much for joining us on the Global Report to discuss the uh, latest GDP figures.